Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Wooly Wednesday. I'm Cindra Kersher, the Shave and Save Them Coordinator and your host for Wooly Wednesday. And we are continuing this month on our fiber journey, getting into talking about some fiber prep and fiber tools. And joining me today from sunny, I think it's sunny out there today, sunny California, is Roy Clemis of Clemis and Clemis. Hi, Roy. Thanks for joining us. It, it is indeed sunny. Uh, a little foggier early this morning. We are up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, but it's nice and sunny today here. Yeah, well, I don't know what it's like for everybody else watching, but we've got rain today, so I'm a little jelly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Roy, tell us about yourself, about your business. I understand that Clemens and Clemens is a father and son duo. We we are indeed, and uh, my father got started in 1970. He actually started wood turning. Uh, a few years before that, that was sort of his high school, uh, after school job. Uh, he was turning wood parts uh, on the lathe that my grandfather had. And uh, the gentleman he was turning for ended up passing away in my dad's uh, senior year of high school. And, and the estate ended up owing him money. And, and my dad ended up taking the equipment and essentially taking the business over and turning it into his own thing. And he standardized uh, a lot of what they were doing there and uh that was it he started with our traditional wheel and uh made thousands and thousands of those over the last 50 years uh but along the way he designed uh, a couple more wheels and uh hand cards drum cards uh basically everything that you need to get uh from sheep to shawl we we uh can supply or make most or or all of it um we were the largest importer of New Zealand Romney wool, New Zealand Romney wool at one point in the 1970s, uh, before there was a real domestic market, which I'm, I'm glad to be able to say that we have a fairly robust and, and growing domestic market these days, and we don't have to import it for the hand spinning market anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got started, uh, obviously it's a family business, and I got started when I was five years old, uh, keeping the floors clean. And by the time I was tall enough that I could actually see the machines, uh, I started using them. And so uh, I've been a, just a wood shop junkie and, and been here ever since. And uh, really got started on the spinning side of things. Uh, after I graduated college, I was 2008. We were in the middle of a uh, yet another financial recession, the, the Great Recession, as we all know it. And along the way from 1970, uh, on up to about that time, we had done a lot of different things. Uh, if it had to do with woodworking, we were in it. So basically we started making fiber art equipment and then we would go get a piece of equipment and a big machine and say, okay, well, well, this can make, you know, 500 wheels, but it only takes two months of the year to do it. So we have 10 months of open time. And so we would find ways to occupy the equipment and, and to keep our guys busy. And, uh, about 2001, we had that that first uh, after the the 9/11 attacks, we had that first financial recession that hit then, and and in the mid 90s, spinning had really started to die down, and so we went from 30 employees down to five employees, and by the time that that second recession, the Great Recession hit in 2008, we were we were down to no employees, and uh, we weren't doing anything in terms of spinning, we weren't doing anything in terms of any of the other woodworking that we had done. I mean, we were doing truckloads and truckloads a week of furniture components and, and just about everything you can imagine. And that had all gone away. And as we got into this recession here, I am a, a fresh college graduate and I'm like, okay, there, there's none of these jobs that they promised us that we're just supposed to be out here. So I, I came home and I said, dad, you know, wh what are we going to do? And he said, well, I, you know, I don't see much out there for me either. So let's just, you know, close the buildings up and, and, you know, we'll rent the buildings out when, when things turn around, we'll figure out what we can do. And uh, lo and behold, there was actually a Yahoo group. That's how far back this goes. Yahoo was still big. There was a Yahoo group dedicated to uh, our spinning equipment. And as we got further into that financial depression, uh, people needed something to do with their time, but they didn't want to spend a whole lot of money. So they started pulling out their spinning wheels. And coincidentally, or, or maybe not coincidentally, you know, the end of the 2000s and the, the early 2010s, was the start of a lot of this green fashion, slow fashion, the fiber shed movement. Uh, a lot of those things really started picking up momentum. And 
uh, we would get phone calls then because people found this Yahoo group and they said, well, can I get a drive band for my spinning wheel? Can I get a drive band for my drum carter that's 30 years old, but still works really well. And once we started supplying those, then people started to call and say, well, can I get a new set of hand cards? Can I get a new drum carter, new spinning wheel? And so it really took off and grew organically that way. And so that was the early, early 2010s. We really got back into it full time and said, all right, let, let's get back to this. You know, we have all of our old jigs and all of our equipment still runs. And let's find a way to make this sustainable with just the two of us. We don't need to manage a lot of employees. And so, you know, we've were, really worked on uh, efficiency as far as uh, maximizing the output with just the two of us. But we've also wanted to get really close to our customers. So we started traveling the country as well. So uh, certainly in, in pre-COVID times, not so much the last two years, but we uh, travel the country. We do uh, 10 to 12 shows a year all over the country, mostly sheep and wool shows, whether it's uh, New York Sheep and Wool. This year we'll be doing Maryland, which is great. Uh, just all over the country. Wisconsin Sheep and Wool is another big one that we love. Mm -hmm. And so we travel the country. Uh, we teach workshops uh, mostly mm -hmm. in drum carting and in fiber prep. And that's what we'll, we'll talk mostly about today. And we make the equipment. So uh, there's, like, <laughs> like you said, there's just two of us. And uh, we manufacture all the equipment to kind of get you from sheep to shawl. And we also now do have uh, good clean fiber, which is a, uh, you know, we're also part of Shave to Save initiative. Uh, what we found in traveling to all of these shows is that there are a lot of producers who may not be able to sell their full clip. And a, a clip is what we talk about when, when a, uh, a sheep producer goes and they shear, all the wool that they have is called a clip. And so they might be able to sell three or four fleeces, but they've got a handful or, or maybe five or 10 of them left over. And so we like to be able to, to get our hands in the wool bags at those shows and, and reach out and contact some of those producers and say, hey, do you, do you have any more of this? And most of the time we find them you know, just grateful and say, hey, you, know, you have a way that I could sell this? And we'll say, yeah, like, you know, don't worry about going to the shows. We'll come, you know, pick it up from you and uh, you don't have to market it directly that way. And what we do is we bring it back uh, from our trailer or we, we bring it back in our trailer, I should say, from those shows. So it basically travels free on board and we bring it back here. We wash it and we make it available in uh, project size amounts. So two ounces, four ounces, eight ounces, 16 ounces. And the nice thing about that is that if you're ordering from us that way, you already have the exact amount of fiber that you need for a project. So if you say, well, I want to do a pair of socks and it requires four ounces. Well, you don't have to guess and say, well, should I, should I buy a pound of fiber or should I buy eight ounces? Because I, I know I'm going to lose quite a bit in the wash. And then, you know, there, there's going to be some vegetable matter and all this. Uh, the way that we do it is when you order four ounces, you're going to get four good ounces of fiber. And that, that's why we call it good clean fiber because it, it's ready to process. It's ready to use on the equipment that we make. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of us in the nutshell. We, we make the equipment as well as uh, having the fiber available. That is quite an overview. <laughs> Very thorough. I can tell this is not your first rodeo, Roy. <laughs> you didn't ask for a short intro, did you? <laughs> No, it was perfect. Thank okay. you. <laughs> now I'm I'm curious. You uh, that's and that's quite a comeback. I I really got to hand it to you and your dad because you guys went through quite a downturn and and turned it around. That's fabulous. Yeah. And you um, there's a third generation. Am I right? You are correct. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my son Hank is two and a half. And is he uh, pushing the broom yet? <laughs> he's not. No, he's about halfway there. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, there was a, a bunch of road construction. We were on on the uh, the road last week for a show. There was a bunch of road construction, so he was telling me all about it. And so I came home and I quickly uh, put a uh, put a little jackhammer together. I took a block and and drilled a couple dowels in it, another one down. And so he's in the backyard right now, just doing this <laughs> and saying bomb, bomb, bomb. So he he's going to be ready for the equipment, you know, like just like I was. As soon as he can see it, he'll be ready to use it. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I am going to switch over just to solo view, Roy, because I know you have some 
some things that you would like to share with everybody. Yeah, and let me, I'll transition this here so you have my overhead view. And before you get started, let me just remind everybody that um, any, if you have questions now, if you have questions that come up as Roy's demoing, feel free to put every, your, your questions in the comments and we will try to get all of them answered at the end of the chat today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm happy to answer questions and go off in whatever tangent or direction this takes us. Uh, I kind of have the, the, the hour structured a little free form, uh, but you know, happy to head off. I, I've got uh, at least a dozen different breeds here that we can talk about. And I want to talk about the lock pop and flicking, which is kind of like a, just a basic intro as far as getting started. We're going to talk about hand cards, a blending board, and then a drum carter. So we have all that equipment to kind of talk about and do some little demos on. And then also, uh, you know, some, some fiber different breeds that we can talk about as well. So Sindra, I have some Shetland in front of me. Is, is that something that maybe we could get started with? You want to talk about that? That sounds great. Okay. So Shetland is, is one of those fun breeds in that uh, it's really fine, super crimpy, and you can see it's on the overhead here. Uh, super crimpy. And let me, I snapped this one out already, so it's going to be nice and relaxed, but let's take this one here. And if I snap it out, you're going to see that it, it snaps back really hard. Uh, so that's one of those, uh, real, like really great for socks. Anything like that is really good. Uh, cause you can spin it nice and tight. It'll be really durable and long lasting, but it's also very soft. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about some of these finer wools. Uh, Shetland is, is in there. Uh, CVM is definitely one of those finer wools. Uh, CVM, Rommeldale, uh, really like that. And we have a, a one producer in Wyoming who's got about uh, 70 sheep out there uh, between the CVM and the Wensleydale. And, and man, we get a lot of a lot of CVM and we sell a lot of it. We, we really do love that breed. Uh, they call the CVM the, the poor man's merino, but I, I, if you know enough about it, it's, it's really a rich man's merino. It's, it's really nice. Uh, it's got good crimp. It's a lot easier to open up. It's not quite as fine. Uh, and I think that tends to make it a little bit longer lasting. Uh, but let's talk about this Shetland that's in front of me. I'm gonna use a couple tools as we get started. This is our lock pop, and then this is a flicker, okay? So we're gonna do the same thing with both of these tools. With one of them, we're going to do it um, while we hold the fiber stationary. On the other one, we're gonna do it while we clamp this uh, lock pop in place and the tool will be stationary. So give me just a second here as I run this clamp up. And Roy, you're calling that a lock block? <laughs> lock pop, P-O-P. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, the reason we called it the lock pop, a lot of people said, well, you, you guys uh, you know, kind of missed the name there. Are you, are you sure you didn't want to call it a, a, like a lock pick? Uh, because a lot of people think about picking and, and flicking kind of as the same thing. But if you Google lockpick, you'll you'll literally get millions of entries where people have uh, are talking about trying to get into a door or a car. But if you Google lock pop, you only find one thing. So that's that's the easy way to remember how to get that. OK, so here's my Shetland and we're just going to pop up and down on it. OK, so you kind of hold the tip into place and pop it up and down and on the opposite end here. Pop it up and down and then pull through. And there we have our fiber cloud. Okay, so on the, on the overhead view, you're like, wait, it almost went away to nothing. And that's what we want. That's kind of our goal with most fiber prep is we wanna be able to get to a fiber cloud at some point. And the goal of all fiber prep is to be able to draft out the bundle of fibers that we want so that we can then insert twist and then make yarn. So if you've ever said, well, what, what's the whole point of fiber prep? Why do I need to do that? The goal is to be able to spin the yarn that you want. And the only way that you can do that is you need to be able to draft out the exact amount of fibers that you're looking for. And you can't do that when you have this nice tight tip in here. You can't just draft out and say, well, give me give me 10 of those fibers. That's how that's the bundle of fibers that I want. You can't do that. Just draft it out and do that. But very quickly, we can take it to our lock pop. And there we are. So now this, like, like I said, you can 
just insert some twist. You can spin right from the lock if you want to, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, as far as having that little uh, cloud feed right into your drum carter, feed right into your blending board. Uh, the lock pop or flicking is a great way to pre-process. What I mean by that is you get a little bit of the vegetable matter out and you're pre-opening your fiber. And, and I heard uh, Mary Jean last week, she was talking about uh, sort, 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 right? So did I say that enough times? So for me, it's like pre-process, right? Don't just start, for, for me, don't just start by throwing something at a drum carter or throwing it on a blending board. I want you to take a look at what you have, get your hands in there. Uh, you know, is this fiber really a, a high quality fiber? The only way you're gonna know that is by getting down in the weeds Unfortunately, sometimes you do have a lot of weeds in there, but getting down in the fiber and kind of separating that out and seeing what you have. Okay, and we'll do the same thing here with the flicker. And this time we're going to tap and flick. And tap and flick. And again, there's our little fiber cloud. And here's what we started with. And you can see how quickly you can go from that to that. And that's what we're looking for. That's our very basic, uh, you know, before you even get started, I like to see you do that. That's if you're, well, I have sheep and I'm not sure even what fiber processing is. Mm -hmm. Give that a little try. Uh, if you're saying, okay, well, I'm a knitter and I, I think I want to do spinning or, or maybe if you say, okay, well, I've done spinning and I'm, I, I don't want to buy these braids. I really want to support uh, some of these producers. How do I go about doing it? The flicker or the lock pop is really your best ways that you can do it. Uh, the uh, the flicker is, is really the relatively cheap way. Uh, it's a much smaller and lighter piece of equipment. I, I want to say they're, they're like around the mid thirties. Uh, the lock pop is uh, just over a hundred dollars. So it, I mean, it, it's really good way to kind of leg your way into fiber prep and get started. And these are also tools that you will use uh, throughout your whole fiber prep career there. Roy, let me let me interject real quick because I, I had a couple of thoughts. I, I was amazed the first time you used that lock pop, how efficiently that opened that lock. That was impressive. And I can I can see folks going through a lot of fiber pretty quickly and pretty ergonomically. Yes. And then the, the flicker being a great piece to travel with. If you just want to take some locks, you're visiting somebody for the weekend and you want to work pretty easily while you're talking or something like that. Absolutely. The, the lock pop, especially being able to clamp it down to your table, your workstation, whatever it is. What I recommend for people is, you know, once you have your washed fleece, and that's something, you know, we can also get into is make sure you wash your fleece before we even get to this stage. But uh, once you have your wash fleece, go lock by lock through it on this lock pop. You get a really good feel for that whole fleece. Like you, you get a good big picture feel is the fleece consistent, right? As far as length and color and all those other variables, cramp, all those other variables, it's also gonna give you a good chance to sort out, uh, well, maybe I should have skirted a little bit more. This looks kind of britchy. I'm just gonna set this aside. Uh, you know, you're gonna say, well, this part over here was three inches long, but this part over here was five inches long. I, I really don't want that in my final project. Or you might say, hey, you know what? This, this part over here was just a little bit tender. So I'm gonna take that off. Uh, you know, it's also great for if you're working with a lamb fleece, those lambs, they have that really cute curly Q tip on them. And they're usually softer than the breed is in general. And a lot of times you can, you can buy them uh, a little bit of a discount because people know that they aren't quite to the breed standard. And a lot of times those tips do break off. So you, you can get them at a discount often. Sometimes people pay more, just, just depends on the breeder uh, or the, the producer. But a lot of times you want to run those through a lock pop, take that tip off of here. Because if it's something where you, you take it straight to your drum carter or your blending board and you start processing it there, those tips break off in the bat or in your roll lag. It's much harder to get them out when you're trying to spin than if you take them out here at the pre-process stage. Mm -hmm. And then you were, you were talking about the flicker as far as uh, transportation or, or being portable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the flicker is great to just toss in your bag. Uh, I recommend if you're going to do that, uh, a, a piece of leather, a sheet of leather. If you want to flick on your lap, you could, you could even do that in the car. I saw somebody asked here about, am I using it just on the tabletop? Yes, I, I am using this, uh, just on the tabletop and I'm just tapping and flicking, uh, right on the laminate tabletop and, 
you know, it doesn't damage it. If you're going to spend hours and hours or days and days and days and, and flicking a whole uh, fleece, I, again, I would probably put like a leather down or maybe a piece of, of hardwood that you didn't particularly care about, but you can flick right on top of, you know, tabletop, pant leg, whatever it is. Uh, eventually, if it's on the softer side, you might just wear right through. So think about that. But yeah, it's, it's extremely portable. And, and I think most spinners toss one in their bag just in case. Like if you have a braid of fiber that gets a little matted or felted, you can just flick it open just a little bit and you're right back to spinning with it. Nice products. I like it. You made it look so easy too. <laughs> I, you know, people say that all the time and I say, wow, you, you must do that so much. You make it look so easy, whether it's this or some of the, the drum carding classes that we do. And a lot of it just goes back to the tools are designed right. And when the tools are designed right, they're they're really easy to use. They're really intuitive. And you, you don't have to have put in the hours that we have or that, that I have in particular. You don't have to put those hours in. You're, you're going to be pretty close to being that good from the start. Mm -hmm. Roy, as, you, as you're going through today, could you possibly hold up the tools so that we could get the sideways view? Because I know some of the flip, yeah, that's, I wanted to see whether it was curved or flat. I know that yeah. some of them, some of the manufacturers do the curve that you have and some do them flat. I know yeah. folks prefer one versus the other. I don't really know why you would want curved versus a flat. Is there a, is that an ergonomic thing, personal preference or? Mainly it's the ergonomics for for the flicker when you're you're tapping and rocking. It, it's easier to kind of have just part of the flicker. I, let me make sure I see that word. It's a lot easier to have just part of it on there and, and you're not tapping that whole flat part of it. The other thing is the way this curves back, your knuckle would be hitting the table if this was flat. And oh, so that yeah. makes that a lot easier. And then for the lock pop, we took that same curvature and I got to clamp down but I, I can show you when I take it off. We took that same curve and made that the top of it so that you're not engaging all of the teeth at once is another thing. Uh, yeah. A lot of fiber prep, the underlying factor here is friction. Mm -hmm. So if you have a nice long tease water that's nine inches long, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a blending board or a lock pop or a drum carter, if you're engaging all that, that fiber against thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny little teeth, uh, you're, you're either gonna tear the fiber or you're going to damage the equipment. And so the curve lets you engage fewer teeth while still being able to carve. Thank you. I yeah. wondered about that. That was a great explanation. The other thing I will say is that traditionally, and, and I don't know why this is, but traditionally a lot of cotton cards were always flat. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at some of the older ones from, you know, that, that still survived from the 1900s, the early 1900s with the leather backs, You'll see a lot of those were flat. I'm not sure if it was just because they were easier to make that way and they you know, made them by the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is we tend to sell a lot of flat into the, the, the flat back cards into the Navajo Nation. And I, I don't know in particular why that is, mm -hmm. uh, whether they, they just got started that way, whether it was the first person who, who happened to buy one happened to buy that pair and, and they've gone that way. But then you'll also find uh, teachers like Stephanie Gosted, for example, out here in, in California. She's up in the mountains. She travels the country. Whenever she teaches, you'll just see this pocket of flatback cars in an area. And you're like, oh, Stephanie, Stephanie must have been in New York last week. Because then you'll see like five or six pairs of hand cards of flatback cards go there. And we, and we almost never sell them. So it's a little bit preference uh, as far as who the teacher is, because people tend to buy equipment that the teacher recommends. Mm -hmm. But in general, I'd say, 95 or more percent of what we sell is the curve back because we do find it to be more ergonomic. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. There was one more question, Roy, about the flicker. Yeah. Um, with the flicker, you hold the fiber against the table and then work the flicker down against it? Yes. Is that, is that your technique? Okay. Okay, so I have the flicker in my hand here. And I'm, or I have the, the wool in my hand here, and the flicker is just going to go up and down, and I'm kind of rocking through the tips. Uh, yeah. Until that pops open. And then we, we go and do the opposite end on the butt end. Okay. We just kind of run it through. And you'll find, with most fiber prep, you will find as many different techniques as there are teachers or even people who are doing those techniques. This is the way I do it. I'm going to hand card differently probably than anyone has ever, not anyone, but I'm, I'm going to hand card differently than somebody else might or some other teacher might have taught you. 
Uh, again, we were just talking about ergonomics. You got to do what fits well for your body. Do that technique that works well for you. This is something, especially if we're talking about lock by lock by lock. A Shetland fleece, we're only talking a couple pounds. So lock by lock doesn't take too long. But if we're talking about, you know, some of these bigger, even a CVM at like, you know, six, seven pounds of fleece, that that's a lot of locks. If we're talking about a Wensley da- or a Tease Water, which can get up there, those Lincoln Long Wolves, those, those Lester Long Wolves. I mean, we're mm-hmm. talking about a lot of fleece. We're processing a lot of individual locks. You want to make sure that you're comfortable doing it, which is also one of the reasons I recommend the lock pop, because I like being able to not just sort your fleece ahead of time, but pre-process it. Because when you're standing at your drum carter, if you're sitting there and working through the lock and then feeding it in and then working through the lock and then feeding it in, it, it's going to take quite a long time. But if you're more comfortable, more relaxed, and you say, okay, let me take an hour and pre-process some fiber, and then I'll go to my drum carter. Well, you, you know, you're going to take your time at your drum carter down, you know, to less than half. So it really makes you more efficient. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Somebody says they love the lock pop. <laughs> We do too. I mean, we came out with it two years ago, uh, request of a, a couple of different customers, and it's a game changer. And, and I can tell you, uh, for sheep to shawl competitions, it's really a game changer. We're trying to very quickly open up the locks. Uh, we we really love the sheep to shawl competitions, just as far as being able to bring people in uh, and and making making the fiber arts a not just a, a competitive sport, but also something that's. Uh, <laughs> more viewable right it's it's really a spectator sport at that point and being able to, to bring people in and, and so anything that we can do to help promote the uh you know the sheep to shawl and, and the aspect of bringing the new people into this uh you know we're all for it so w- when somebody said hey I'd, I'd like to have this it'll help for sheep to shawl but you know in general it's a great fiber prep tool we said yeah let's take a look at that mm-hmm. so. Roy, we had one more question about the flicker before before yep. we move on um, one of our viewers has asked, would you use a flicker if you are prepping for wet or needle felting? Oh, you certainly could. It just depends on what kind of preparation you want. Now, if, I mean, if you're needle felting and you, if you're going back down onto a pre-felted mat, you could needle felt this right into place. But at the same time, you still have quite a bit of texture here. I'm going to hold this up so you can see it on the overhead cam. You still have quite a bit of texture here that you could you could felt right into place, especially, you know, this is white. If you had a nice uh, black pre-felt that you were laying this on top of, you would get an awful lot of texture and color. You can see the crimp there is just gorgeous on this Shetland. Uh, you could get an awful lot of texture and color there uh, if you just pop those ends open, and that was the only way that you processed it. Great, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, that is Shetland. Let now, me... is that your good clean fiber right there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. It is. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that's a, a good thing to plug. So the uh, again, the good clean fiber. We work with producers all around the country, and one of the things, especially since we've got got started with this initiative, is a lot of the people. A lot of the producers with some of these heritage breeds aren't familiar with uh, selling their fiber yet. And so, you know, they got into it because, oh, a friend said you should have these sheep and they happened to buy these sheep. But then they found out, oh, the, the fiber is worth money because it's this particular breed. And one of the things that we focus on is the education aspect of it, because I'll go to a producer and say, okay, this, this is $10 a pound fleece. But if you coach your fleece, if you manage your shearing time, if you change your feeding habits just a little bit, I'm happy to pay you $20 if it's really, really nice fleece. And so one of the things that I always encourage people, I don't care whether you're buying from me or whether you're buying direct, we need to focus on educating our producers as a consumer and I don't mean that just as, you know, our, our producers within Shave and the Saving, but I mean in general for the hand spinning market is if you are somebody who buys fiber or if you're somebody who buys uh, processed fleece or if you're somebody who buys yarn and you don't like vegetable matter in it, you need to be able to go back to the, the person who had it before you and say, you know, I didn't I didn't really like that. 
I would gladly pay you more to do a little bit more work. And, and this goes a little bit back to what Mary Jean was saying last mm -hmm. month too. It was like, okay, we need to do a little bit more work here and you, you could make this a lot nicer and I'd be happy to pay you more for it and, and make this even more successful for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is from one of our producers that has a very nice coated fleece. And that's really what we aim to work with is people who have coated fleece, people who are on pasture, so they're not feeding uh, alfalfa and all that, that stuff that gets kind of caught in uh, the, the crow's nest, which is like the, the back of the neck, uh, that whole area. And, and so we really work with producers to say, this is what we're looking for. And uh, we end up with really high quality fleece that way. And uh, again, we wash it here. So it's prepackaged. We ship it home and we're able to do it at a fairly competitive price because it's basically free on board coming back in our trailer when we come back from a show. Since we've already washed it, when we ship it out, we're paying for only shipping about half of it because once you wash out the grease and the dirt, mm -hmm. it goes from you know about eight ounces to about four to five ounces. So uh, you know you do lose so anywhere between thirty and seventy percent, just depending upon the breed and where it was mm -hmm. raised and things like that. Uh, so we're able to ship it, include free shipping, and uh, provide it at a, a pretty competitive price. Great. Thank you. It is beautiful too. Thank you. Yeah. All right. There's Shetland. I do love some Shetland. <laughs> I, I don't like the animals. They're just kind of, they're small and they're tiny. They're not much higher than the weeds. So I'm not big fans of Shetlands in general, but if you meet a good producer who raises on pasture, then, I, then Shetland can be really nice. <laughs> All right, uh, what's next? Should we maybe talk about some long wools? Sure, yeah. All right. Okay, here's some cheese water. And were there any questions as I kind of move on and get some things ready? Any more questions coming in? Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, Facebook user says, yay for education. We buy fiber at the farm as well and always spend time with the shepherds discussing how to improve quality of fibers. There you go. And that is really important. Yeah. The feedback has got to get back to the to the shepherd. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Dwayne wants us to not forget to show the side view of the lock pop. Ah, okay, okay. We won't. All right, there's some um, that is Lincoln. And this one's possible. Okay. So I have a few of our long wolves here. Okay, so this one is Tease Water. And Tease Water can, Tease Water is one of the newer breeds that we have here in Shade and Salem. This one can uh, be out to nine, sometimes 12 inches, just depending on when they shear. Uh, it, it's a nice, long, wavy curls. Uh, this one was my Cotswold here. And I think this one, if I recall, was a mid year clip or even a half year clip because it's only three, four mm -hmm. inches long. Again, it's got those nice long flowy curls. Here is some Lester long wool. And this is one of those that definitely can be very long, but uh, this again is a mid-year shear at only six inches. And then this is Lincoln. And so you'll see uh, these are all kind of grouped together because they are all longer. Uh, so they're kind of the, the long wools. And let me process a few of them. I think a good way, especially if you're getting started to process these, is with a pair of hand cards. And hand cards are made typically in two different styles. You might see more than two styles, but in general, it's best to think about them kind of as two different, you know, two different ends of the spectrum. And what I mean by that is that wool cards are your relatively uh, open, uh, TPI or tooth per inch. So ours are 72 teeth per inch. Uh, the, they are a deeper or, or taller pad and a little bit narrower as far as the carding pad. These are designed to be most efficient at a relatively coarse, relatively long fiber. The cotton cards over here are much finer TPI. These are 120 teeth per inch. They're designed to be most efficient at a relatively short, relatively fine fiber. Now you can card anything you want with either one of these two different hand cards or with anything in between. They're just going to be most efficient 
at opposite ends of the spectrum. Now, there are people, uh, I can think of uh, the Switzers who have Paco Vicuñas up in Colorado, and Chris swears by our bull cards, even though she's working with 13, 14 micron. And on the other hand, uh, I know uh, Judith McKenzie swears by our cotton cards, even for the long ropes. So it just depends. You, you kind of have to find whatever works for you and whatever is most efficient for whatever type of fiber it is that you're processing at the moment. Most people end up getting a pair of both and saying, okay, this works best for this project that I'm doing right now. So I'm gonna set these cotton cards aside for the moment. And we're gonna go with the wool cards because we are going to work with this fiber here, which is relatively coarse and relatively long. I'm gonna use my flicker here to clean this just briefly. Somebody left his movie after he did his last demo. <laughs> but that's, that's the way it is. Thanks for showing that, Roy, because that was one of the questions that popped up, too, is how do you clean all of this equipment? I, I aim to please, Sandra. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to card these, and again, this is the Cotswold, a little bit shorter than, than average. Uh, but to card these, we're going to drag it across the top. This is called charging your cards, okay, charging your hand cards. Mm -hmm. I might want just a little bit more than that. Okay. Yeah, just drafting these across the top. There we go. Get those in there. And typically you would do this while seated. So this one would be on my thigh as we draft across. It makes it a little bit easier that way. Uh, but for the purposes of this demonstration, for me to be able to demonstrate a whole lot of different things, one camera view here is the best. So we're gonna draft these right across the top. And you can hear, I'm not grinding the teeth. The teeth aren't really grating. I'm just going right across the top. And you can see that they are already beginning to be strained out. Those nice long curls are getting straighter and straighter. And now I have some on this card and some on this card. We're going to put them in the same direction. And that is going to remove the majority of the fiber from this card. And we're going to go back and continue to straighten them out. Okay, open them up. Like now you may see, especially on an older pair of hand cards, a lot of times people will mark them left and right. And that goes back to a very uh, antiquated uh, system of thought in that these hand cards were originally made of leather. And if you gave them to a friend or somebody else who carded in a, a different pattern than you do, so say you card like this, but someone cards like this, if they card in a different pattern than you do, they would wear a different, uh, all the little teeth would kind of move in a different direction. And mm -hmm. as they wiggled in, in that different direction between the way that you card and the way someone else cards, they would wear through the leather. And the hand mm -hmm. cards would not last very long. Well, thankfully, we now use this uh, canvas uh, backing uh, with a, a, it's got a, a rubberized backing with some canvas on it. And so they last much, much longer. So we no longer have to worry. And they're also much more durable. So we no longer have to worry about loaning our hand cards to our friends and having them not work anymore or having the teeth just start to fall out. Okay. Uh, so if you see that, you go, oh, I don't have to worry about that. Roy said that was from a long time ago, way before he was born. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's your little hand card uh, tip of the day. Uh, so here I have this all on one single hand card. And we could pull this off of here on a bat, a really small little bat. But what I'm going to do is take my half inch dowel. And yeah, you can see this on the overhead better. We're going to wrap this around here. And I'm going to lift and draft it out as I do. Okay. I'm going to continue to lift and draft this. There we are. And then I'll just firm it up in my hand and slide this off of here. Now at the top, I was talking about fiber prep. The whole goal of fiber prep is to be able to draft out the bundle of fibers that we want to create the size yarn that we want. And that lets us do exactly this because we can now draft this out. 
and it collapses around this kind of core of air that we had in there. And you can see there's our drafting triangle. And we can then start inserting some twist. And just that quickly, we're off and making yarn. Okay. Now, this is a woolen style of preparation, typically with a fiber, you know, that we're talking about nine inches long. That might not exactly be something that we want to do with it, but it's definitely a way that we could at least open up the fiber. You don't have to take it off there, Rolex. But certainly for what we had here, which was a, you know, a four or five inch long half year, mid year clip, uh, it's really a great way to process this, uh, some of these longer wools. And uh, just depends on what your project is, whether you want to do a woolen or a worsted or semi-worsted kind of preparation with it. But mm -hmm. that's how we use hand cards. And that's the kind of preparation, or at least one of them, that we can get from them. Mm -hmm. so questions about that? Uh, comments. Regina Boley sweet and Hi, Regina. She says, great job carding midair. That's tricky. <laughs> Way to Indeed. go. <laughs> Indeed. Shelly says, this is so great and helpful. Is it, is it being recorded? Yes, Shelly, it is being recorded. You'll have indefinite access to it, um, both here in the Facebook pages and Facebook group and on our YouTube channel later. Um, she says she's at work and she has to keep stepping away, so she's missing bits and pieces. But, well, yeah. thank you for, for joining us uh, uh, in the middle of your workday. We appreciate that. <laughs> uh i do have a question that keeps popping up so we're gonna ask it and we're gonna keep the answer really short and sweet because it okay. doesn't specifically apply to the 23 breeds and shave them to save them okay but because you were talking about your cards can they be used for cashmere yes cotton cards can be used for cashmere cashmere is literally a whole nother animal and that it's goat uh and you do have the hair involved so there's that whole dehairing process mm -hmm. i can what I'll talk about when I talk about uh, some of the um, the multi-coated breeds applies a little bit to cashmere. So kind of keep that in mind. Great. Thank you, Roy. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So one more question before we move on to the blending board. Uh -huh. Any tricks on transferring fiber between the cards? Because that can be... Oh, yeah. You know, I do that really quick and, and sometimes I make it uh, look seamless and really easy. The, the one thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll go back to what I talked about earlier as far as talking about friction. So if you think about the length of the fibers that you're working with, if you're engaging more fibers, you're going to have a lot more friction. And mm -hmm. the same kind of thing is going to happen with if, if you're engaging more teeth. So if I mash these teeth together, I'm engaging all those teeth at 72 teeth per inch all the way across this whole thing. We're talking about a lot of fiber. So instead of mashing them all the way together, just go gently across the top. And I'm, I'm showing this so you can see it on the overhead. But see how I'm just kind of sliding across the top? Don't get down here all the way in the teeth because even I, I can't do it. But if you're out here where you're just riding across the top, mm -hmm. it's much more doable. So it's more of a floating across rather than a locking and grinding. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got it. In any time with, whether we're talking hand cards, whether we're talking about carding directly onto a blending board, whether we're going to be talking about on the drum carter, you don't really want the teeth to mesh. You want to be carding the fiber, not the equipment. <laughs> Good. I like that. That's, that's, a, that's a true story. When I walk up and I hear a drum carter going tick, 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 or the whole time, I'm like, all right, okay, something's wrong. Stop. Like, let's figure it out. We, we want the equipment to be going through there. We don't want to, or the, the fiber to be going through there. We don't want to just wear the equipment out, uh, you know, while it's in use there. So, Great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Anything else? I'm going to grab another breed here. So, okay. Something else. So there's a, a question about dehairing Icelandic fleece. And I think while we won't speak specifically to Icelandic, um, I think Roy is going to address dual coated. So. Yes that will yeah. hopefully answer your question when we get yeah. there. Dual coated again, it's it's a lot like the uh, it's a lot like the cashmere question, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so same same kind of thing. Uh, they're they're gonna process similar. You want to separate those. And that, that was one of the things that I probably should have talked about with Shetland is, is Shetland can have up to five different coats, which is just kind of a, a whole weird thing itself. Typically what we find with the Shetland in the US is that it, it's bred for fineness. Like I, I think it's, who is it? Whispering Pines or whatever. I think they're back on the East Coast somewhere. They have really nice Shetland that's bred just for fineness. And it's like single coat. You won't find, you know, any guard hairs or any even, uh, 
you know, you're gonna find really uniform fiber in there, but you can find some Shetland that still has three and four different coats if that's what that particular producer is is breeding for. So mm -hmm. um, Shetland is really unique and versatile that way. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the blending board and I'm gonna do Jacob because Jacob has the many colors and it's nice to kind of blend those together a little bit on a blending board. So I'm just going to pick this hand a little, pick this fleece a little bit open by hand while we're talking about it here. Because we're going to process this pretty much the same way that we did the hand cards. So we're going to start by drafting it across the top, charging the card. Okay. I'm going to move over here, try and make sure that you can see it on both cams. And this is this is done a, a lot easier when it's flat on the table, but again, uh, and when you're sitting at the table, but again, for the purposes of the demo, we're going to make this work. Okay, so I'm just drafting this across the top. And then I will grab my flicker, which is right here. You saw me using earlier. So same tool. Okay. And again, we are carding the fiber, not the carter. You'll hear those teeth, but I'm really gliding across the top, like Cindy said. I'm not mashing those teeth down in there. And then the transfer was something somebody had asked about earlier. And again, we're just gliding right, right across the top. And I'm only doing a small portion of this board because this is a demo. I could do the whole thing if I wanted to, but we don't have to. There are no blending board police that say, well, you have to. <laughs> I promise we won't show up. If you want to if you want to do some sampling, there's nothing that says you have to use your whole drum carter or your whole blending board or, or your whole pair of hand cards. Just just do a little little sample. That's okay. Now, Roy, you're using one breed here, dual colors, multiple colors. Yeah. Would you ever use the blending board to blend breeds? You absolutely could. Um, a couple of things that I like to talk about as far as that goes is if, if your hand's spinning, you want to stay within two-thirds of the length of your fibers so that the shortest breed is no less than two thirds of the length of your longest breed. So if you have a, let's say a six inch fiber as your longest one, four inches would ideally be your shortest fiber. Uh, if you get anything longer than that, you're going to have a really hard time spinning them. You're going to have a, a pretty difficult time blending them. Mm -hmm. So I like to see you stick within that two thirds ratio between your shortest and your longest fiber. Other than that, Absolutely. Uh, if it's something that we wanted to card directly onto the board, let me see. Do I have some CBM maybe? What do I have? Sure. Okay. So I've got a little bit of Jacob thrown down on here. Let's just say, for whatever reason, that I wanted to add a little bit of CBM right on top. And the thing with the thing with blending boards is you want to stay stay really thin and wispy, especially uh, when you're first getting started. Okay. And these fiber lengths are also going to be fairly similar. So let me pull one of these out. And there's a good lock here. Pull one of these out so you can see. Right. We're fairly close as far as these fiber lengths go. So here's my CMM. Here's my Jacob. This is, is two fleece that would be really great to blend together. This would lighten the color up a little bit, as well as add a little bit of a softer hand with the mm -hmm. CMM. And, and when you're blending, my question, you know, somebody says, oh, can I blend this and can I blend this? My question is always, what's your goal, right? Like, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to use the Jacob? Because oftentimes it's a, a relatively cheaper fiber. Do you want that as your base? And you're trying to stretch that out. And then you're using the uh, CVM to give that a softer hand. And if that's your goal, go for it. So always think about anytime you're blending, are you, are you doing it just because you want to say you blended those two or or are you doing it because you want to achieve something? Okay. Well, as you said, yeah, different different breeds are going to have different fiber qualities that can lend to a different yarn product. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Yeah, absolutely. We have a we have a um, newbie question. She says, "Can I ask a total newbie question?" Absolutely. <laughs> When, when carding, do you end up with wasted or unusable fiber bits, or does everything generally go through the carders and end up as useful? Yeah, you're going to end up with waste, whether you're carding, whether you're combing. I don't make combs, so I'm not going to, and I should say I don't make combs yet. It's something that's been on our, on our back burner for a little while. But whether you're talking about carding uh, or combing, whether you're talking about woolen or worsted preparation, whether you're talking about blending boards, hand cards, lock pop, whatever it is, there is going to be waste. And I'm okay with that. I, I know people are kind of get caught up on, oh, I'm zero waste. I want to keep this composted. Okay. It's not going to a trash facility, put it in your backyard in your composter, uh, you know, or, or use it as, uh, you know, matting around some, your vegetable garden or whatever it is, but don't be afraid if you say, you know what, some of this is just junk because the whole point is whether, whether we're talking about a pair of socks, or whether it's a sweater that you're making, you want to be proud of that garment and you want to be excited about wearing it. So if you take a garment and you say, all right, well, I'm gonna put all this carding waste, no matter what, I'm gonna put everything in and I'm gonna spin it. And you, you get to the finished product and it's got a lot of neps and noils. And as, as soon as you wear it and wash it a couple of times, it starts to pill and, and then you're embarrassed to wear it out. Because people are like, oh, okay. And they're like, yeah, I made it. And they're like, you don't even want to tell them that anymore, right? So <laughs> you, you should be proud to whatever garment you make, take it out, wear it, be happy about it. And, you know, maybe maybe we need to stop calling it waste. Maybe, maybe we need to, to say that, you know, we're repurposing the other half of this wool or, or whatever it is so that we don't feel that, that it's wasteful. So we can kind of change the mindset about that. Mm -hmm. But you really want to use the Primo stuff uh, for your project. And that was kind of what I was talking about earlier when, when I said use your lock pop or use your flicker. Think about that as like your pre-filter before you even go to a blending board. You know, there's a lot of vegetable matter in here that I could have gotten out. So before you go to a blending board, before you go to a drum carter, kind of think about those kind of things like, okay, how can I get, you know, some more of this out? So I'm just using the top quality stuff. And uh, that's where I would say as a newbie, don't worry about your waste. Uh, just use the best stuff that you can. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned today too that they use that waste for their uh, chickens' nest boxes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> There's lots of uses for it. Yeah. Okay, so I've got my I've got half a board covered up here. Uh, I started with that Jacob base, carded it in. I got some CVM, tossed it on top, carded it all out with the flicker. Now I'm going to use my hands here, and I'm I'm looking for about one and a half to two fiber lengths wrapped around the dowel here. And so we think about that fiber length that was about three to four inches. So I'm gonna go just a little bit more than that on here. And I'm lifting and drafting. And as I do that, I'm trying to make it not too tight, but not too loose, kind of the Goldilocks zone. We slide that off of there. And then we have our roll lag. Now this is a much more uniform roll lag. Uh, I think it drafts a little bit better than what we had coming off of the hand cards, right? I, I think you're able to process a little bit better if we're gonna talk about starting with fleece. Uh, I think you're able to process it better because you have more control with the hand, with the blending board than you do with hand cards. Obviously, I think it's a little bit better and easier to control the blend if we're working with multiple fibers. Uh, but this is what a blending board will get you. And I mean, you see this, this is gonna make a very nice modeled yarn, especially with that little bit of the light gray CVM that we tossed in there. And this is a, a very nice blend for, you know, being very, very quickly processed. Mm -hmm. okay. Roy. Yes. Well, tell me the difference between a Rolag and a Puni. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my understanding, and I'm not going to duke it out with anybody if they say anything different. <laughs> But my understanding is that if it's wool, it's a rolag. If it's cotton, it's a puni. Oh. In general, rolags tend to be much larger than the puni is. Going back to what I was saying as I first pulled that off, you want somewhere between one, one and a half, maybe two fiber lengths wrapped around your dowel. So on a short, fine fiber, if it's very short and very fine like cotton, you would use a very, very small dowel. 
Mm -hmm. okay? We're talking about Lincoln. You would use a much larger dowel. And so that's why wool rolags or whatever you want to call this fiber preparation that is tubular and wrapped around a dowel and then removed, uh, whether it's a pony or a rolag, wool rolags tend to be larger just because you would tend to make them around a larger dowel because they're going to draft better that way. Okay. And is that a quarter inch dowel you have there or? Uh, half inch. So half inch. A half inch dowel, that's what's included with our blending boards as well as the brush, as well as, and I didn't even use the starter rod because I'm just so used to doing it. But this is kind of like, uh, uh, like your training wheels, right? The, the mm -hmm. starter rod helps you kind of clamp things together when you're first getting started. You want to make sure when you're doing your roll eggs, you'll see a lot of people uh, using two half inch dowels or just two dowels in general. The, the problem with that is that you get a oval fiber preparation rather than a circle and you get a figure S or a S in there, kind of a figure eight, rather than just having it collapse around uh, that core of air that you have. Mm -hmm. and so the Rolex don't draft nearly as well if you're using multiple dowels compared to just using one dowel. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I love the, the look of that combination too. Yeah. Those, those two fibers. So <clears throat> we've got another question. Do you have to make a roll lag off of the blending board? Or can you lift it off and use it more like a bat? Yes. So you can pull it off one big sheet, like 12 by 12 inch sheet. Uh, particularly if you're a felter, that's a really great way because we can apply fiber on the bias. Okay. So let's say you have some fiber going lengthwise. But you can also, like, let's just pretend that I covered the whole board, right? You can apply fiber on the bias. Mm. So if you want your fiber prep for felting, you can get your fiber going in every which direction you want. And this is going to be a mess for me to take off tomorrow, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to always have that one nice base layer going the same direction. But you can, you can totally, and I realize I picked the worst color that I could have to show this, but... <laughs> <laughs> you can, let me grab some of the black here, right? We can draft some of this on the bias in this direction, and then go back and draft some this direction, and then back to this direction. So if you're felting, you can take this nice 12 by 12 square and have your fiber running every which way. And, mm -hmm. and I like to do nice thin layers. So I do a whole whole thin layer covering the board against the teeth. And then I do a whole thin layer, maybe coming diagonally in one direction, and then a whole layer going diagonally back against the teeth, and then a whole layer, uh, I'm sorry, a whole layer vertically one direction, and then a whole layer going diagonally the other direction and go back and forth and kind of build it that way. But it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great way to, to make a, a felt base in general. But if you're talking about spinning, if you just want to make a bat, absolutely. Lay it all down, make yourself a nice 12 by 12 bat, peel it up on off of there, you can, you can get kind of a, a, maybe if you want to say faux bat or something like that, but it makes a nice, you know, roughly 12 inch by 12 inch bat. That's a, a still semi-worsted preparation, even though we're working with a tool that's most efficient and designed for woolen preparation. Great. Thank you. I never even would have thought, that was a great question. Never would have thought about the blending board for yeah. prepping fiber for felting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Linda. Hi, Linda. She says, how do you avoid neps with fine fibers? Are they due to poor technique or the fault of the fiber itself? And I think you may have kind of answered this a little bit already, but let's let's yeah. hammer it home. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the short answer to that question is yes and yes. So mm -hmm. is it the fault? Is it the fault of the fiber? It absolutely can be. Is it poor technique? It absolutely can be. Uh, I like to see you use your lock pop if you can, especially with those fine fibers. Like for, for the purposes of shaving to save them, we're talking the CVMs, we're talking those Shetlands. I'm trying to think what else. You know, even the like the Florida Cracker is surprisingly fine if you find the right fleece. That's one of those fun breeds where it's it's like uh, a mystery box, right? Like, is this gonna be 35 micron or 22 micron? I don't know. Every Florida Cracker fleece is just a little bit different that way. Um, but with the finer fleece, make sure you run it through your lock pop because a lot of times what you'll find the the body of those, uh, you've probably more commonly seen it on like a Merino. They have lots of skin fold, 
folds, right? The, the skin when they're sheared is like really wavy. And so mm -hmm. as the shearer comes along, a lot of times they'll back up and, and go back and catch what they missed or something like that. So at the, at the base or the, the butt end, the, the cut end, a lot of times you'll just see like a little second cut that's like attached right here. And if you just toss that right into what you're processing, mm -hmm. that's instantaneously, instantaneously going to be a net burn oil for you. Uh, it, it, so if you have your lock pop or your flicker and you can run it through so it's nice and open, you're going to take all those short fibers off of there instantly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that to your whole fleece, by, by pre-checking out your whole fleece, you're going to give yourself a much better opportunity to process without all those nips and oils. Now, the other thing that I'll say is that your drum carding cloth makes a huge difference. And if you're out there shopping for drum carters, you will find that our drum carters are the most expensive drum carters on the market. And, and I don't apologize for it. We, <laughs> we do that for a reason. We only want to sell you one drum carter. We're going to sell you the best drum carter that we can possibly make. We use the highest quality components. Our carding cloth comes from Europe. It's specially made. Uh, designed to our specifications, mm -hmm. and it is a mill style cloth that is sharpened to a point. What that means is with your fine fibers, when, and I just pulled the drum carter over here so I can actually do this. Okay, so when this comes in, and let me pop the other lock here. There we go. And yeah, you can see that right there. Okay, so when this comes in and it feeds under, and it just starts to come underneath and I'll roll by hand. So we can, again, I pulled the wrong color out, but <laughs> you can see it's just starting to come through right here. And when this fiber goes underneath and it starts to come into contact with all those thousands of tiny teeth on the mill style sharpened carding cloth, like we have, the fiber has an option. It can either go to the left or to the right because that sharpened tooth is almost acting like a knife and splitting right between each and every one of those fibers. What you'll find from everybody else out there is a uh, carding cloth that we call sheet cloth. And so it's going to be eight inches wide. Uh, it's not ground to a point. The teeth are clipped just like you would find on a blending board or on a pair of hand cards. And on, on that equipment, it's not really a problem because you don't have this thing going round and round and round at 100 RPM. And you don't have all the possibilities of the fiber catching on the drum cart on the cloth. And so when you have that that sheet cloth, which is really, really cheap and, and really easy to get, uh, the fiber can either go to the left of it, to the right of it, or it can sit on top of that flat spot. And that's what gives you your naps and noils. Now, the, the more times that you put something through a drum carter, the more opportunity you have for it to create more naps and noils. Unless, again, you have this mill style sharpened cloth. Uh, the couple of things that we've seen people do to combat that is they say turn very, very slowly, right? If you're carding fine fibers, turn slowly. And all they're trying to do is get you to turn slow enough that the fiber slips off of those individual teeth and pulls down into the cloth in order to not make those nefs and noils. The other thing that you'll see them do is they'll say, oh, you need 220 teeth per inch or something silly like that. And all that does is it just makes more areas for the fiber to catch on top. And usually what they do is they use a little bit smaller tooth. Uh, it's hard for us to see by eye, but the needle size or the tooth size is a little bit smaller. So there's a little bit, little bit less chance that they'll actually sit on that on top and make that flat spot. But what we do is we say, hey, we're going to buy this really expensive cloth. We're going to replicate what mills do. They don't change up their equipment every time they uh, go from having one type of fiber from another. They, they might make some minute changes, but compared to what we do on an individual hand processing level, we can run it all here. Uh, we might gap the teeth just a little bit differently, but if you're buying the right carter, you can run cotton, you can run your long wools, you can do your art pads, you can do everything in between, and you only need 72 TPI, that mill, shot, mill style sharpened cloth. You can do it all. You won't introduce the naps. You won't introduce the noils. And yeah, that's that's my spiel there about <laughs> it might not be operator error because you might have the wrong equipment. 
Yeah. Well, I'm just gonna just gonna shout this out, Linda. Hi, Linda. She says, "I love my CNC drum carter." <laughs> Hard to beat that, right? I didn't I didn't pay Linda anything for that. <laughs> uh, all right. So, what do we have left to talk about? Um, we're probably out of time, honestly, to do a a full drum carter demo. But let me show you. Uh, just kind of the preparations that we can end up with on a drum carter. Sure. So here is a woolen bat, and here's the same fiber on a semi-worsted bat, and it's hard to see without me getting all this stuff out of the way. But one thing that I hear about from people who say, oh, drum carters aren't you know that versatile. You can only make bats on them. But I'm going to show you here four different types of preparation, and these, these won't all be the same fiber. But we have that, and we also have this. So the reason that I love drum carters, I, I love to get people into drum carters, is because of the versatility. So you can make a semi-worsted bat, and that means all the fiber is running in lengthwise. So that's going to be your worsted, your nice uh, tightly spun uh, for socks or something along those lines, right? And you can make a woolen bat. So woolen is when we feed the fiber in either sideways or at a 45 degree angle, and they kind of meet across the middle. So you can see there are lots of, of fibers going different directions. Now this is approximately the same amount of fiber in these two bats that I have on the table in front of me. The difference is with the woolen bat, the if you think about uh, all the crimp, the crimp is pulling this bat in in every single direction. But with this one, with the fiber running this way, the crimp only pulls it in in one direction. So it tends to open up. So it's just a little bit different uh, style of preparation and different what we can do with it in terms of how we're going to spin it. Then we can also do Rolex, just like we did on our blending board, just like we did on our hand cards. We can do Rolex on our drum carter. And the other thing, which is really a game changer for a lot of people, is what we call carded sliver. Uh, most people are familiar with this as roving is what, what most people call it. I like to use the term carded sliver because that does distinguish it just a little bit from top, which has been through uh, a commercial comb or even a pair of hand combs. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with the carded sliver, it's pre-drafted. So uh, it makes your carding or makes your spinning very easy and very quick. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I really love to do is I don't like to spin from bats. My hands get very sweaty. And so if I'm trying to spin from one of these, no go. I get to the end of the bat or maybe even halfway through and I'm just like, ah, this is a tangled mess. I don't like it anymore. So if I'm carding, if I'm spinning from carded sliver or if I'm spinning from Rolex, I have a much better time and I set myself up for success a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. It's a very versatile piece of equipment. It is indeed. <laughs> uh, I think maybe the, the last thing we should probably talk about and then get to a few more questions if they're there it is the multi-coated breeds because i did want to talk a little bit more yeah. about the lock pop if that's okay mm -hmm. yeah thank you i forgot we didn't do those yet that's i know right we, we could go <laughs> on and on but people have to work at some point right i don't want to take a whole work day uh so there was a question uh, about yeah. showing the curve of the lock pop right mm -hmm. thank so you is. so let me set it back down here front and center and let me get out. I have some. This is Caracal. Okay, and this is a Caracal lamb. And as I, as I talked about earlier, the lamb, sometimes they just have those really cute curly cues. If I hold that up, you can see those little baby curly cues. They're so cute, right? But a lot, a lot of times they, they break off. And so we don't necessarily want that uh, in our spinning. So you can always just pop that on the lock pot and make sure that they open up make sure that they don't come out. And then, and this is a lamb, so I'm not sure how this is gonna go. I haven't tried this yet. But what we can do is we lash on just a little bit here and we'll pull out the longer hair fibers there. And then what should be left, ah, see there's some more of those. What will be left here is the nice soft down part. Now there's not a whole lot here in this particular breed, but let's try it again. All right. So if I open that up, open those tips up, and then I just get this and I lock it into there. Oh, and yeah. See, okay. And then I pull this out here 
And there's my coarse fibers. And there, as I pull just a few more of those out, there is my soft undercoat. And so we have the question I, I know about cashmere and about Icelandic, same kind of thing on here uh, when you're processing, whether we're talking about churro or whether we're talking about caracal, which are our, our multi-coat uh, shaven to save them breeds. All right, we pull that out of there, pull out just a few of these longer ones again. And then what we have left is this really soft undercoat here. And so the multi-coated breeds are fun because you can spin them multiple ways, right? You can spin and process them multiple ways, I should say. You can card and blend them all together. You have to be a little bit careful because it, as you see here, these are relatively short and relatively long. This is about half the length. A lot of times it, it's even less than that. You might have three or four inches on, and I can never remember what they call the short one and what they call the long one. But your undercoat might be only you know three or four inches, and the longer one, if this is an adult, might be nine inches. So you really have to kind of manage that when you're processing and, and when you're spinning it. Uh, but uh, you can blend them together. And then what happens is just like it does on the animal, those longer hairs, uh, a longer wool protect the soft, finer fibers. Uh, mm -hmm. We spin them together that way. But you can also separate them and say, you know what, this is going to be a rug or an outer blanket. And this is going to be my next to skin garment over here. Mm -hmm. So lots so of so you could do that with, as you were talking about the multi-coat Shetland, you could use Shetland, that technique on the Shetland, and possibly even Wiltshire Horn, right? Wiltshire Horn is, yes. we started out calling it a hair breed, but Deb Robeson says it actually has a whole lot more wool in it than we initially thought. I'm not going to argue with Deb. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, I'll leave it at that. I, yeah. You can certainly process a lot of these things in, in a variety of ways mm -hmm. and uh you, you could certainly do that same thing with the wilshire on if if, mm -hmm. if you find the right animal let me put it that way <laughs> right you got to find the right place for that that applies to all yeah yep so going back to the drum carter for a minute how do you get your fiber off there the, the question or the the sliver um, yes. a couple of folks have asked if you're doing that with the diz I am. And let me okay. see if I can grab. Oh, here we go. All right. Yes. So this is a Diz. Okay. So it's a just a piece of wood with a hole in it. And so rather than peeling the fiber off in one large sheet, uh, we peel it off just by uh, opening up a little bit of the fiber and we remove it by pulling it off through this tiny little hole. And the fun thing about it is it kind of blooms when we do that. So it's kind of hard to believe, but let me put these side by side. This came through that hole. It is hard to believe, yeah. Yeah. So it just, it really blossoms when, when you're working with it there. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're able to get that ball. Yeah, the whole thing pulled, off, and this is, this is one drum. So this is about one ounce of fiber pulled off from one drum. All of it was pulled through one diz, just like that. Mm -hmm. And can you also diz off the blending board? Some people can. <laughs> I, I have not found it successful myself. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you could say I'm more of a purist in that the, the blending board is a woolen preparation tool for me. I'm going to use it for what it's most efficient at. So I haven't spent a lot of time also trying, trying to get it to be a, a semi-worsted prep tool. Uh, but I have heard people saying, if you work at it, you, you, can, you can diz off of there. You might have more success if you peel it off as, as a bat, a 12 inch by 12 inch bat, and then diz through there, you might have more success, but I, I haven't been ter terribly successful myself. Okay. Always worth trying. Let us know how it works out for you. That's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, if you're on Instagram, you know, pop a photo up there or a video, tag me in it. And I'd love to see it. <laughs> Well, Roy, that is all of our questions. And I think that is, that's all the techniques that you wanted to talk about today, right? We, we covered all I, I think, that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, there are so many breeds, which is the, the nice thing about this initiative. I feel like, you know, we could probably spend an hour talking about all the different ways to process, you know, each of these different breeds. But uh, as far as a, a basic overview goes and, and hoping to, you know, pull some more people in and, 
and uh, get them hooked. Uh, I think that's you know pretty good for us for today. Yeah, definitely. That's our idea. We want we want everybody hooked on these fibers. That's it. <laughs> So let me uh, let me share some contact info for those of you who might be interested in going to the Clemus and Clemus website to look at some of these products that we talked about today. It's Clemus, C-L-E-M-E-S dot com. You can reach them on their Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Clemus and Clemus forward slash. And then their email, you can reach Roy or maybe Henry. I'm not sure who answers email, but info at clemus.com. And then, of course, if you want more information about Shave Them, Save Them, if you're not already involved, if you'd like to download our free fiber profiles, if you'd like to download our free brochures, you need to reorder stickers, all of that good stuff is at rarewool.org. And if you want to become a member of the Livestock Conservancy or learn more about programs that we run beyond Shave Up to Save Them and the different breeds that we work to conserve, reach out and find us at livestockconservancy.org. And if you have questions, you can always email us at info.livestockconservancy.org. All right. Any last parting words, Roy? Yeah, I actually, thank you for having uh, me on. I think this was, this was really great. So thank you, Cinder. Thank you, uh, a whole uh, everybody from shaving to save them there and and for the initiative i mean it's been great for us and seeing a lot of new faces we get to meet a lot of new producers uh so that's been a lot of fun but i also wanted to thank you for uh pronouncing our last name correctly it's probably one of our most asked questions uh so you you got the pronunciation right there with clemis that was really good <laughs> and then uh, just the last thing I want to say, you know, clemens.com slash GCF, uh, you know, if you're searching for one of these rare wolves and can't find them, uh, we have more than a dozen breeds uh, in stock uh, just about all times. You can find them there and we have all the equipment you need as well. So other than that, thank you. And I hope to see you all out on the road. We're getting back to in-person shows. We did our first two shows in two years uh over the last three weeks so it was really nice to be able to see people even though we're still behind masks that's okay we were able to do hands-on drum carding and fiber prep classes and so i would say if you head over to clemens.com and take a look at show schedule and see when we're going to be in your neck of the woods and hopefully sign up for a workshop with us awesome highly recommend it you guys Roy, thank you so much for coming today to join us to talk about this. I'm getting so much feedback. I don't know if you can see it, but everybody's saying thank you so much, Roy. We've learned so much. So great. You're welcome. Glad to do it. All right. Everybody, thank you so much for joining in. We've had a lot of viewers today. Remember, you can go back and watch this again later. Watch it as many times as you want. Feel free to share it, like it, all that good stuff. And we'll see you next month, third Wednesday of the month, 2 p.m. And we'll keep going down this fiber prep trail. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.